Baptist Southern Baptist Church. It is a joy to see you all here this morning. Uh, when you walked in, we hope that you received a worship guide that looks like this. If you're visiting or if you are a member, we hope you got this. Uh, this week we have a monthly calendar in there with information about different events going on uh, this month. Uh, birthdays are listed on there, and then all of the announcements uh, that you need to know about are listed inside the worship guide. Uh, the Recreation Committee wants to invite you to join us uh, for the football fellowship on uh, Sunday, February 12th. We'll meet in the commons area. There will be a dip contest. Uh, we're looking for sweet dips and savory dips. You can win the coveted red First Southern Big Dip Spoon. It's out in the Welcome Center. You can check that out. Or you can get a chocolate football for the sweet dip. So please bring your dips. Invite somebody to join us for that. It'll be a great time of fellowship. We'll have games and activities and things going on. And if you want to watch the game, watch the game. But just come and have a, a good time of fellowship and uh, being together and eating together. Uh, it'll be a great time. But we are here to worship this morning. We are glad that you are here. We pray that you encounter the living God today, <clears throat> that his spirit moves within you today and that you are drawn closer to him. If you're visiting with us this morning, we are praying for you. We pray that you encounter God and you feel the warmth and love of the fellowship that we have here at First Southern Baptist Church. Uh, we would love to connect with any visitors uh, that we have, and the way we do that is through a connection card that looks just like this. If you look at the seat in front of you, underneath you'll find these cards. Uh, if you would take the time to fill that out, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, after the service, you can take that to the Welcome Center. Myself and other volunteers will be out there uh, to receive that. If you have any questions about anything, please let us know. Uh, there's ministry tables out there as well to check out uh, what all's going on in the life of First Southern Baptist Church. Uh, but as we begin this morning, we're going to have a time of scripture reading. Mr. John Worth is going to come and read our scriptures. If you would, turn with me to Romans 10. I'll be reading verses 9 and 10. While you're turning there, my name is John Worth. I'm one of the deacons here at First Southern Baptist Church. I just wanted to let you know that. But also, I want to let you know if you have, one of you ladies, if you have something that you don't feel comfortable talking to one of us men about, I just want you to know that our wives are also available. Okay? Just keep that in mind. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Salvation means being saved from your sins. Salvation is essential have a relationship with God while on earth and to have eternal life with God in heaven after death. Let us pray. Father God, we're so thankful for this opportunity that you have given us to come to worship your house today. Lord, I pray that you'll be with Brother David as he brings us your message about the importance of our salvation. Father, I pray for the ones that are not here today I ask that you be with them for whatever reason that they couldn't come. Lord, I'm thankful for the many blessings that you give each and every one of us. And I just pray that you'll continue to bless us. Lord, we lift up the loss to you. And we just pray, Father, that as we go about our everyday lives, that the things that we say and do will always glorify you and bring honor and glory to your name. Father, I pray that we'll all be good witnesses and servants for you and your church. All these things we ask and pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand together and worship.
Amen. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. And uh, for a winter day, it's a little bit warmer, although it's wet, but it's good to come together and fellowship and worship together. I want you to think just for a moment about what you think of as worship. Worship. What do you think of when you think of worship? We gather together and we sing. We, uh, we kind of have our normal procedure on Sundays. Somebody's going to get up and do a welcome. We're going to have some scripture verses and things like that. But what do you think heaven is going to be like? It's going to be worship. You know, I really believe that some people that I talk to are not going to be excited about heaven. There's no TV there. Or at least not a television show they're actually watching. And so I think people are thinking, well, heaven, you know, that's, that's that out there future thing that I'll probably end up going to or something like that. But listen, when we gather together on Sunday mornings, we gather to worship. And we're going to be doing this for all of eternity, folks. That is what heaven is going to be about, eternal worship. And we are going to be worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's be prepared for worship in our hearts even this morning. I pray you've prepared already, but let's ask God to prepare our hearts right now. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come before you humbling ourselves. Lord, we have no pretense here. We have uh, nothing to bring to you that benefits you in any way. But Lord, you have provided salvation through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sins. And for each one that has believed, Lord, we thank you that we can have salvation right now. But Lord, I pray that as we think about what worship is, that Father, we would focus on you. 
that we'd set all the distractions aside and that everything would be about you today. But Lord, we want to truly worship you. Help us do that. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. says that it's supposed to be Carla, but she's not up to singing full par yet. So she told Jackson this morning, and he said, well, you're who we wanted, but we'll settle for Chuck, so <laughs> that's who you got. Well, the song I'm going to try to sing this morning is an old song, but as we've been talking about Christ, and who he is in Hebrews, this song came to my mind. And one thing he is for me, and I hope that he is for you, is he is the cornerstone. Without Christ, we wouldn't have the church because he created. He's the foundation and the cornerstone of the church. Jesus is the cornerstone, came for sinners to atone, though rejected by his own, he became the cornerstone. sin oppressed on the stone I am at rest when the seeds of truth are sown he remains the cornerstone Jesus is the cornerstone was in Bible study today, and Keith Slee told me 
that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. And that is a wonderful thing to hear. What we have to figure out in our time is what evil we have to stand against and what good we have to stand for. That's what we have to do. If you read through the ages, the church has had to figure out what good to stand for and what evil to stand against. That's your task. You are not alone in it. You have just heard about Jesus, who is the light. You have that light. Do not be discouraged. Do not be dismayed. But man, cling to him. Cling to him. Without him, you have no hope. We can sing about how this is our Father's work.
pray together. Father, I pray that we could be found in you this morning. We would know that the evil that may seem so strong in this world is nothing to you. Help us to see so much of you that all of it falls away for us. Help us to trust in you more than in ourselves, more than in anything in this world. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. It is a wise thing at times to look up some of the songs that we sing, maybe on the internet, in a hymn book, and think through the words. Uh, it, it astounds me to think that God would look away from my sin and look upon His Son, Jesus Christ, and declare, that is now my righteousness, because my righteousness is in Jesus Christ. God demands perfection in his heaven. Jesus said in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, be therefore perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Now that goes beyond our comprehension. It goes beyond what we can even fathom. But Jesus Christ has secured our righteousness in himself. And when God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We just sang about that. That just is astounding. Turn with me in your copy of God's Word to Hebrews and the second chapter of the book of Hebrews and the second chapter. I want you to imagine with me just a little bit or just think maybe through this understanding of how important your Bible is to you. The significance of your Bible. Some have a very high respect of the Bible. Um, some are going to look at their Bible as something that is truly a treasure to them and they're going to see the tremendous value of the Bible. I'm afraid sometimes, though, we leave it as a book and rarely open it. So I'm going to dig a little deeper here this morning in your mind and ask you, how much do you know your Bible? Um, there are those who have treasured the Bible throughout time and history. What astounds me is to read about their lives, and so many of them have a profound success I, uh, I love reading about our early founding fathers of our nation in United States history. It's one of my uh, things I like to read a lot about. I think about Fisher Ames, who um, was instrumental in the founding father of our nation. He was the one who really was the constructor of the Bill of Rights. If you think about the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution, a man by the name of Fisher Ames is the one who constructed those and put those things together. He started studying Latin at six years old. He could already read English. At 12 years old, he took the entrance exam to Harvard University. He graduated with his Harvard degree at 16 years old pretty profound. He became a teacher after that. He was asked the question, what would you contribute your success to? And he gave an answer. He gave the same answer that John Witherspoon was asked. John Witherspoon, one of the founding fathers, he was signer of the Declaration of Independence. He read the Bible when he was four years old. Another one, John Trimble, Supreme Court Justice for uh, the state of Connecticut. He had read the Bible through by the time he was four years old. Many of you know um, Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. 
by the time she was seven years old, had memorized 27 hymns word for word and could quote chapters of the Bible by seven years old. Daniel Webster, you know him, statesman, very influential in the early founding of the United States of America in latter years. One of his school teachers by the name of James Teppan bought a brand new jackknife. Now that would have been a pocket knife in those particular days. He brought it to school and the teacher said to his entire class, I will give this brand new pocket knife to the student who memorizes more scripture, the most scripture. This was on a Friday. Class was going to be on that Monday. He said, whoever has memorized the most scripture by Monday morning, I will give this brand spanking new jack knife to. Daniel Webster was in that classroom as a grade schooler. He went home and started memorizing Scripture. On Monday morning, the teacher asked some students how many verses of the Bible did they memorize, and several of the students said, well, six verses, four verses, three verses. And Daniel Webster said, I'm not sure how many verses I have memorized. Would you like to hear them? His school teacher said, yes, please, just quote to us the Scripture verses you memorized over this weekend. After 70 verses of the Bible, the teacher said, we don't have any more time for this. You win the jackknife. Daniel Webster complained. He said, I got at least three more chapters to quote to you. So what is common to all these individuals? They said, if we have any success, it's because we have the Word of God in our hearts and in our minds. It can make such an impact on us, yet many times we have this temptation to set it aside and not see the significance and the importance of what God has clearly laid out for us and said, this is important. And yet we neglect it so many times. You'll notice that God does not present things in this text in the way that we're sort of used to receiving them today. Things have to be sort of sensationalized. They have to have some quippy kind of statement. They have to have some kind of attention-getting device. Uh, There's a common term that's used on the internet today, clickbait. Have you ever seen where anything gets you to click on something? Because if you click on something, whoever put that there gets some money, by the way. Uh, you got to watch 30 seconds of a commercial on YouTube so that whoever uh, you're wanting to listen to on YouTube will get some money from that advertisement that is there. We, We live in that kind of society. God doesn't come along and say, let me kind of really get your attention here. Let me, let me tell you. But in this text, he says something that every single person ought to just set up and say, I need to hear this. So you read along with me as I read out loud Hebrews chapter 2, and we'll begin at verse 1 and following. It says this, therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness with both with signs, wonders, and diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to His own will. We read this because God is saying, <clears throat> let me kind of give you an added emphasis here to recognize the importance of what salvation is. Now, there's a lot of ways that we try to 
encourage people to pay attention to the gospel. We say this is the most important thing that you can possibly hear, and that's the gospel. We tell individuals in, in preaching and in sermons and in teaching ways, we, we say you need to hear the gospel because it's going to be the determination of where you spend eternity. Is it going to be in heaven or is it going to be in hell? And so we began to see God saying, hear us something of great importance. The temptation, even in Christian circles, is to say, well, yeah, that's really important. And then we go on and live our lives almost as if that has not made much difference at all. We recognize the importance of, of living the Christian life out that that life begins when we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And we understand the impact that God makes on our lives every day. We understand that, that our prayer life becomes powerful because we're a child of God. We can read the Scriptures and they have great significance and meaning into our lives. We begin to understand the great power of fellowship among believers that we might gather together and understand what it means to truly worship together. We understand that God impresses us with the Holy Spirit and helps us make wise decisions to avoid some of the pitfalls that we can fall into in this wicked world. We begin to understand the ways of God as we live out the Christian life. The book of Hebrews, I remind you, was written primarily to Christians who were of a Jewish background. So there's a lot of the traditional Jewish things that's involved in the book of Hebrews. We also know that there were most likely some individuals who were a part of this group, this church, this, this gathering of believers who were not believers yet. And God is saying, listen to these words. They are of incredible importance for your life. I want you to see some points here this morning. Point number one, give earnest heed to what you hear. This is what verse one is speaking of. This is God saying to someone he wanted to write these words down, and he said, give heed to these things. Pay attention to what you hear. You are responsible for what you hear, and we are to seek understanding in those things. Now, the Greek word for give earnest heed to is all in together one single word. It is the Greek word prosecho. It is the idea of paying particular attention to something of great importance. Now, we understand that everything that God says is important, but we understand there are times when God says pay particular attention to this. Now, I know that you might not get excited about reading the genealogies of Adam all the way down to Abraham, but yet God says these things are important because even in the Gospel of Luke, we read that, that Adam and the descendants of Adam go down to Jesus Christ. And by the way, you can actually understand human history by those genealogies and says those things are incredibly important. Now, we, I know, don't apply those things as significant in our own lives. But Jesus Christ says these things are important. We need to have a ready understanding of why God put it there so that we can apply it into our own lives. Every single human being on the planet who has ever lived and who will ever live needs to know about salvation. Though I say that, we recognize there are many, many, many that it is too late because their life has ended and we see things in the Word of God that ought to jump out to us where Jesus is walking on water and, and we understand the things that He did and we understand there are so many important things that we need to understand so that we can grasp in a deeper way in our lives what it means that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. Because everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation points to Jesus Christ. And God is saying here in this single verse, verse 1 of Hebrews 2, you need to pay particular attention to this. Now, the temptation is that we might say, well, yeah, if I, if I was near death, that would be really important, you know. But yet, do you not understand it is important for you every single day? 
I know that it's so tempting to us think death is some distant thing. What well, ought not, just look how people drive on the Lloyd. It ought to scare you to death. Death is something that is, is imminent to many of us. Death is something that we recognize and say, God, I do not have long for this world. And we began to understand that God spoke of these words so that we might hold them dear into our lives. Now here is a specific thing that we need to understand. And when God says these things are important, it ought to be something that is kept before our eyes. The scriptures ought to be there because if we do not, they begin to lessen in their significance for our very being. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 20 and 20 through 22 says, My son, give attention to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Do not let them depart from your sight. Keep them in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their whole body. The proverb writer prompts us to keep the Word of God before our eyes and before our hearts. The Orthodox Jew in the world today will have some things that they have taken words such as that in Proverbs and have taken them very literally. You maybe have seen an Orthodox boy who will have a, 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 a strap. It's actually of a, of a kosher animal, but it is a strap, and he will wrap that strap around his arm, and there is a little box on his shoulder, or maybe you've seen the little box that he would have on the, on the forehead. That's called a phylactery. There's little scripture verses in there because the mental image is, I need to keep the Word of God before my eyes. If you were to go into a Jewish, an Orthodox Jewish home, by the door that people enter and exit out of the most, most likely it's the front door of that home, there will be a decorated box there. Sometimes the scripture will be written on the outside. Sometimes there are scriptures that are written are and put on the inside. That little box is called a mezuzah, and it is, it is something that you will see an Orthodox Jew reach up and touch every time they walk out the door, and when they enter into that door, they'll reach up and touch that box because they're saying, we need to have scripture before our eyes. Now, I know that this could be something becoming rather legalistic and, and, and try to go through the motions, and we know that there are many Baptists who've done the exact same thing. They have a Bible sitting on their uh, uh, table, their coffee table, maybe in the living room or somewhere else, and it sits there, and, and once in a while, the only use it gets is when a dust rag goes across it to shake the dust off of it because it is rarely ever opened. God is saying, do you understand how significant these words are that we are to hold into our own heart? My family doctor is Dr. David Schultz and went to the doctor's office this week and uh, sitting there in the waiting room, I look up and every single wall in the waiting room has scripture verses hanging on the wall. When you speak to him, he's going to talk about Jesus. Now, there's something that is significant about having the Word of God before our eyes in every way, shape, or form. Do we actually put it up so that it is significant in our lives and then everybody who comes in and, and, and notices your, your, most, your most relaxed area of living is the Scripture before them? Is it before you and I? When you walk around First Southern Baptist Church, do you notice Scripture? There ought to be more Scripture than flowers, folks. Because Isaiah chapter 4, verse 8 says, The flowers will fade, but the Word of God will endure forever. 
Where is the significance of priority in our own lives? Say, God, this is that which is most important. Now, I understand Scripture can become an ornament, be something that's significant, that really just, yeah, it's there, but nobody pays attention to it. And I understand that that's going on in the world today. You go to the United States Supreme Court before you even open those big, huge doors and go into their gallery where they are at. Those doors have a symbol of the Ten Commandments on it. If you were to go into the gallery where those nine justices sat up on that bench so they hear cases that is presented before them, if you were to look above their heads, you would see a, a, an understanding of Moses who was holding the Ten Commandments. And it's all become an ornament that is meaningless because that very court outlawed displaying the Ten Commandments everywhere in the nation except above their own heads. Now, there is something where I know we get so accustomed to things that it's just an ornament. It's just some sort of tradition that's held over. But in our hearts as believers today, do we understand the value and the importance of God saying, do not let these things falter. Do not let them be set aside. Which leads me to point number two that's still in verse one, the danger of drifting. Now let me give you a mental image here this morning. Uh, I think some of the translations, uh, uh, the King James says, uh, uh, let, unless we let them slip. Now, that doesn't really communicate the picture here in the Greek. In the Greek, it's the idea of a ship that is moored. It is a ship that's either tied to the dock, or it's a ship that has anchors thrown out to keep it steady upon the waters. But if it is to let it slip, according to this Greek terminology in verse 1 of Hebrews 2, it's the idea of cutting all the ties so that it just goes wherever the winds and the waves and the currents would take it. And so we begin to understand the analogy that God says, write these things down, Hebrew writer, because I want you to understand there are those who have just become untethered to the things of God, and they are now just at the whims of the world and the waves that lash about their ship. God says we need to understand the importance of holding to the truth of what God has said. We tend as human beings to rise up in anger if someone were to say to us, you shall not worship on Sunday mornings. We'd get up in a fury, you know. Everybody with AR-15s, you'd have them packed and ready. Nobody's going to tell us not to worship. No one's going to take my Bible away from me. I mean, that's what you heard a couple of years ago with all the COVID stuff. The question is, so now what's the excuse? For not holding to wanting to gather together and worship together as born again believers in Jesus Christ. Well, what is the what is the inhibition that says, oh no, no, I can't do that? My favorite TV shows on Sunday morning. Oh, I stayed up till two in the morning Saturday night. I got to sleep in. I got a headache. Well, if you stay up till two in the morning, you probably do have a headache. Oh, well, we have all these reasons to shove the things of God down to some unimportant place. And we have relegated to God, oh, that's just not important in some way. I think most individuals I talk to would say, yeah, America has gone adrift. That we, in our own hearts as believers, sometimes would just not understand that we have just let things go when God says take this seriously in your own hearts. This text commands us to be the church. That we are to be believers. No matter what 
it is that we are going to face. We hold to the truth of God's Word and we stand strong. The world wants to drive us away from the things of God. That's the tides of the world. That's to be expected. It's not a big surprise if I say to you, we should expect those without Christ to live in sin. Yet we sometimes, can you believe what they're doing somewhere? Well, yeah, lost people are without Christ, therefore they do not have the founding of God's Word in their heart. And I know there is much in this world that wants to relegate Christianity to an insignificance. And Hebrews is warning here, there is a greater danger than those who are attacking the church. And it is that which simply neglects thinking they've done no harm oh i'm not doing anything wrong i haven't read my bible in a month but yet i'm just okay and god is saying that's called neglect and that is a sin the spiritual life must be attended to no ship survives when it's not tethered you have all those mental images of some some derelict that's washed up on the shore and it's a rusted hulk of metal falling in upon itself on some beach somewhere. And so many times as a pastor, I see Christian lives just like that rusted hulk. God says that will lead to wreck and ruin. Number three, the neglect of salvation. Look at verse three with me here. Here's a point that leads up to the things that I've already said. God has, has said, I have done everything that you need to have salvation. It has been provided for you. Do you believe? And then his warning here in verse 3 is stark. It, it, it is... Um, it is, a, it is screaming, it is shouting, it is saying, do you understand how severe this is to neglect what Christ has done for salvation for every single person? We live in a world that wants to present Jesus among other things. We want to present Jesus among other deities, our belief systems, and multitudes that say, oh, well, there's other ways to be saved. Heaven's like a mountain, and everybody's got their own path to get up to heaven. Look at verse 3. Verse 3 is saying, if you are allowing any other way than Jesus, you are calling God a liar. You are spitting in his face. You are declaring to the world, Jesus, why did you even bother? You didn't have to do that. There's other ways. The Hindu gods, you know, Jesus, you didn't, you didn't have to die to get saved through Hinduism. You didn't have to die to get saved through Islam. You didn't have to die to get saved through Buddhism. Jesus, why did you have to die? Well, you didn't. You can just get saved some other way. Do you hear what God is saying in verse 3? Because he's saying, if you propose some other way, you're saying Jesus' death on the cross was a waste of his time. And God is saying in this third verse, this is the way, and there is no other way. Did you hear this? How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? To neglect? How shall one possibly escape? Do you know what God's saying there? How hot do you think hell is going to be for the one who treats the very Son of God as if you make no difference? Pretty stark, isn't it? Pretty severe pretty much should wake up and we should listen to such things. 
Hebrews says here, how can you possibly escape? That ought to bring the very fear of God into the heart. And we say as believers, aren't there multitudes, preacher, that do not know? I mean, there's just an ignorance. They don't know that Christ has died for them. Then what does that do to you and I who sit here in our relaxation in our comfortable homes, in our comfortable worship services, and we didn't even dare to invite someone to come to church this week? How serious is it to neglect so great a salvation? Point number four, I'm going to back up to verse two here. I know I'm not doing this in the verse orders, but I want you to see the significance here, transgressions and disobedience. These two words are being presented so that we would understand there's a difference between these two words. These are not synonyms. This is not just listing a bunch of words that mean the same thing. A transgression is defined by this Greek word as one who crosses the line. Now, that's a very general statement, but there's, there's purpose and intention in this. As, as we read the Bible, we know where the lines are. God drew the lines and said, stay within these lines. And God is drawing that. You ever had that little boy or that little girl who just wants to be so disobedient? You know, they've been told, stop right where you're at. Do not move forward. Maybe the parent sees a danger or something. And, you, and you, you watch that little little boy, that little girl look up, stare you right in the eyes, put a big smile on their face and go. That's the definition of the word here, to transgress. A defiance of God to say, I want to do it my way. I do not have to listen to you, God. God, God draws the line. And the transgressor says, I don't care, I step over the line. Now, the second word he uses here is, is another strong word. It's the word disobedience. Now, generally, it's the idea of, of having an imperfect hearing. Now, many of us have imperfect hearing, okay? Uh, many, many years ago, it's been probably 30 years ago, I had a cyst in my ear. They had to cut my ear off, literally laid it over on my eyeball, and went into my ear canal and uh, had a cyst that they had to remove, but it had grown around. Now, I'm using old terms here. You of the medical profession, you can laugh. I give you full permission. But they had to take out two of those three bones. It used to be called the stirrup uh, or the stapes, I think it's called, and the anvil. That's the old terms. I know there's proper medical terms, and that's not them. But they had to take those things out. They tried to stitch my ear back together to hear a little bit out of this right ear. And I do hear some things out of this particular ear. And so I have imperfect hearing. That is not what is being described here. This is, this is a description. The disobedient here in verse 2 is the one who sticks their fingers in their ears and says, I can't hear you, na 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 na. Now, why does someone do that? Because they don't want to hear. They don't want to hear. That's what this word means. This is the one who thinks they're going to be all right with God because one day they think, I'm going to step before God and say, God, I just didn't know. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to lie. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to commit adultery. I didn't know I wasn't supposed to steal. I didn't know I was not supposed to hate people. I just didn't know, God, so I should be accepted into your heaven. And God's going to look at that person and say, that is the definition of disobedience. Yes, it is involved with sins of omission and also commission. Both of those are there. But it's the sin of neglect that is most identified by these terms here. This is the determination to say, I do not want to listen to God in my life. Well, they've convinced themselves that they have an out. They have some, something that, that God's not going to hold them accountable in some way, shape, or form. Though the Bible condemns it, 
Yet it's just this attitude of, oh, I, I just didn't know God. God says, no, I, I wrote a book down for you so that you could read it for yourself. I mean, it's even been put in English. We even have modern translations. You even have five-year-old books that you can read stories in the Bible. And, and so it's as simplistic as it possibly can be. There is no excuse before God. Fifthly, God bearing witness. Look at verse 4. God also bearing them witness. You know what that means? It means simply this. Everyone is without excuse. Now, I understand that every reason can be applied to every single sin on the planet. As a pastor, you'd be shocked at the number of people who come into my office and say, Pastor, I just had to sin. My ears always perk up, you know. I just had, you don't understand. I had these three options. They were the only three options, and, and so all three of them were sin. So I had to choose between a sin, a sin, and a sin. And, and I just tried to pick the sin that was the least of the sins. By the way, that is unbiblical. You need to write this verse down, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that God has provided a way of escape so that you will not have to sin. And this is where the argument usually starts in my office. Oh, but preacher, you don't understand. And I usually listen. I'm very polite, you know. I listen. Oh, preacher, you know, the consequences of sinning was going to be less than doing what was right in God's eyes. Now here's, here, and really, uh, there hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to God. But God is faithful, who will not tempt you above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Now think about that verse. God does not say, I'm going to make an easy way out of sin. As a matter of fact, most of the temptations that we're faced with in life is one to choose something incredibly hard to do and not sin, or to sin and take the easy way out. That's where most of us face temptations in our life, to do the incredibly hard thing to do or just take the easy way out. Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, shortly after the time of Jesus Christ, this was during the days of persecution, suffering. There was a man who came to him and said, oh, I had to sin. I, I had to sin. I had to make this sacrifice to these idols. I had to do it because if I didn't make this sacrifice to these idols, they were going to kill me, and I have to live, don't I? And Tertullian just simply said, do you? Do you have to live? His point being, sometimes to not sin is going to cost you severely. And it costs me severely. But God does say, that is what I want you to do. God knows everything. Now, I'll be, be honest here. I'll have people speak to me and, oh, preacher, I had to, I had to sin. All right, let's just make it real clear. You can convince me, okay? Yeah, that, yeah, you just had to say. You can convince me. You can convince the church. Some big story. Oh, I just had to do this. And okay, yeah, and we can be compassionate and kind. And yeah, we understand you just had to do that. You can convince all your family. You can convince all your friends. You had no other option. You convince the government of the United States of America because they make a lot of laws that say it's okay to do this and it is actually a sin. You understand that. So you can convince everyone except God. 
God sees through it all and says, no, no. God is never going to be in favor of your sin. God is never going to listen to any excuse in regards to your sin. God is going to say, I want you to take a stand on the Word of God, be obedient to the Scriptures no matter what it costs you. Listen to this verse here. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders, with diverse miracles, gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to His own will. You know what I hear many in the frame of salvation today. Many individuals say, well, you know, if God would just do such and such, then I would believe. My patent answer to every bit of that is, he already did. Oh, if God would just come out of heaven and walk among people and tell them, he did that. His name's Jesus. If God rose someone from the dead, then I would believe he did that. Oh, if, if, if he just described what heaven is like. I mean, actually talked to us. He said he's been there. If God would just explain heaven to me and hell, then I would believe he did that. If God would just do miracles. Well, what kind of miracles would you like to see God do? Heal people? Raise people from the dead? Feed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch? Walk on water? What kind of miracle would convince you, yes, God is true? And my answer is always going to be, he did that. He did that. I challenge individuals, come up with a new one that God could do that would convince you that He is, and that He's provided salvation for you. Can you come up with something? And my answer is always going to be, yeah, He did that. Why? Because God loves you that much. He gave His all for you to believe and put your faith in Him. So the simple question comes down to the end of this. Salvation how do we know about salvation? He wrote it down in his word, so we should know the word so that we would understand salvation. How do we know what Jesus said? Well, he wrote it down so that we have the words of Jesus Christ. I love the ending of the Gospel of John that describes that. John writes and says, if I wrote down everything he did, the world would not hold all that I could describe that Jesus has done. Jesus has already done that. So what do you need to believe? Because if we read in these verses, we read, there's nothing left to be done. It's all been done. So the question simply is, do you believe? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads right now. I know that to someone who has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, there might be this challenge this morning to say, yeah, I, I've given all those excuses, Lord. I've given all those reasons. I've tried to sort of set things aside as if, well, I can just neglect it and it's going to be okay with God. And every bit of that's been challenged today. I hope you heard that. More, though, I hope the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart right now that you would say, I need Jesus Christ in my heart, in my life that you'd open your heart and say, Jesus, whatever it is you want me to do and do, believe I will do that right now. To the Christian that's here today, it might be that you've noticed that you've been adrift. You've been like that, that little boat that's on the ocean and the winds blow and the waves push and the currents swiftly move you along and you're just going the way the world sort of goes. And today, it's really impressed upon you that, you know, that is a neglect. And I need to open my Bible and I need to get very close to what God says. I need to memorize it. I need to meditate on it. I need to read verses over and over and over again until they sink deep into my heart because God wants to make an impact on your life. He has done this for many individuals. 
And God wants to do that in your life today. For Christian, I pray that you just renew a commitment to walk with the Lord and that you would be in His Word all the time. Maybe God has spoken to you about something today and you want somebody to help pray with you. We have deacons here on the front row ready to pray with you. There are others, maybe, maybe some of the ladies that want to pray. They want a lady to pray with them. Just, just lift your hand up by your shoulder. And some of the ladies in our congregation would love to come up and pray with you. Maybe you want to near, kneel here at the altar. Maybe you just want to stand at the altar. We'd love to pray with you. Maybe God has spoken to you about something else. Whatever it is, you do what God wants you to do. Let's lift our heads. Let's stand and sing. As God leads, you come. Uh, be sure and remember to pray for each other throughout this week. God is going to give you opportunities to think about what was said here today that you might be able to share that with other individuals. So I want to encourage you uh, in doing that. Look for the opportunities that God uh, speaks. Ansel Goodman, would you lead us in a closing prayer, please, sir?